Good, good, good. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for spending your lunch hour with us. It's fantastic to see so many uh, folks joining us online today. Um, before we start, I would just like to take the opportunity to acknowledge that uh, the University of Calgary is located in the heart of southern Alberta, and we both acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprised of the Siksika, the Kainai, and the Gainai First Nations, the Tutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Good Stony First Nations. And the City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Districts 5 and 6. So it is a pleasure today to welcome uh, Robin Shutt to give us uh, a seminar today. She is a Senior Study Coordinator at Health Canada, and she has worked coordinating environmental health research for 15 years and works very closely with scientists and epidemiologists in the targeted epidemiology and biomonitoring section to help deliver necessary data to support Health Canada's work under the chemicals management plan. The focus of her talk today is going to be uh, sharing learnings and telling us about the human biomonitoring program at Health Canada with a focus on sort of what it is, um, some of the challenges and opportunities that might be there uh, for research for, for folks like us to use this Canadian biomonitoring data. So I'm going to turn it over to Robin. She'll go through her presentation. We'll hold all of mm -hmm. the questions uh, until the end okay. and um, take it away, Robin. Okay, thanks so much. Um, uh, despite my um, Health Canada um, affiliation, I too am joining you from Calgary today, but I also wanted to acknowledge that the Population Studies Division's offices are located in Ottawa and are on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. Uh, so I'm really happy to be presenting to you. Um, it's nice to make connections locally uh, here in Calgary. So. Here we go. <laughs> um, so I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. Um, and uh, as far as our objectives go, these are the objectives or slightly revised versions of the objectives that I shared uh, for those of you who are doing this for CME. And so we'll just start with the first objective, which was to provide an overview of human biomonitoring activities at Health Canada uh, which aim to better understand real life um, environmental chemical exposures of people living in Canada. So um, first of all, what is human biomonitoring? <laughs> so human exposure to environmental chemicals can be indirectly estimated uh, by measuring levels of uh, in the environment, in food, water, or in products, or it can be directly measured in people, and this is biomonitoring. So biomonitoring is the measurement of levels of chemicals and their metabolites or biomarkers in human populations. Uh, human biomonitoring provides a measure of exposure from all sources and routes, and biomonitoring commonly uses samples of blood, urine, human milk, hair, and other tissues, uh, fun things like toenails, um, uh, meconium, uh, if you're looking at babies. Uh, so uh, the biomonitoring that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, primarily biomonitoring of environmental chemicals. So of course, what are environmental chemicals? Environmental chemicals uh, may occur naturally or be released into the atmosphere as pollution, uh, or we may find them in the foods that we eat, in products that we use, and in environments in which we live, work, and play. Uh, some examples of environmental chemicals of concern for which we have biomonitoring data are bisphenols, uh, phthalates, pesticides, uh, perfluoral alkyl substances, uh, which are found in um, waterproofing and nonstick coatings um, and are referred to sometimes as forever chemicals. And then also naturally occurring um, environmental chemicals uh, such as arsenic, uh, cadmium, lead, mercury, and other toxic metals. Of course, I'm going to be talking about uh, the biomonitoring of environmental chemicals. Um, however, we can also um, biomonitor uh, for biomarkers of effect. Um, 
these may be early preclinical changes, um, altered function, uh, or especially in uh, large studies, um, they uh, may actually be the endpoint of clinical disease. Um, so biomarkers of effect are measured in many different types of studies, but there are really few studies that measure large suites of biomarkers of exposure. Uh, so what kind of, of biomonitoring data do we have um, in Canada? Um, so um, measurement of biomarkers of exposure is, I would say, uh, the bread and butter of our section, which is the targeted epidemiology and biomonitoring section, and also the national biomonitoring section um, in the Environmental Health Science and Research Bureau at Health Canada. Um, so our human biomonitoring program has three pillars. There are three types of biomonitoring data collected within that. There's population level nationally representative uh, cross-sectional survey data, longitudinal data in pregnant people and their children, and other targeted biomonitoring in various populations. So all of these biomonitoring um, activities permit us to better understand estimates of exposure to environmental chemicals. Um, and they also allow the establishment of baseline levels in the population being studied. And they may allow for investigation of determinants of exposure or potential health effects. Uh, so where are we biomonitoring? Biomonitoring has been undertaken all across Canada. Uh, most of the work in Canada's north has been through collaborative, community-based targeted biomonitoring initiatives. Um, and meanwhile, the Canadian Health Measures Survey, which is all these different shades of blue dots, um, <laughs> has collected data on the general population across all 10 provinces. Uh, so I've referred to the Canadian Health Measures Survey and nationally representative data a couple of times. Uh, and specifically, the Canadian Health Measures Survey, or CHMS, is a survey conducted by Statistics Canada in partnership with Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, Health Canada's National Biomonitoring Section uh, leads the biomonitoring component of the CHMS. Um, and uh, this is part of this ongoing cross-sectional survey which is conduct conducted in two-year cycles, and data are presently available for six cycles. Uh, in each cycle, the CHMS samples between 5,000 and 6,000 people living in Canada aged 3 to 79 years to produce national estimates. Um, and then uh, in order for this to be nationally representative, Statistics Canada also develops survey weights uh, for uh, CHMS data. Uh, CMS, CHMS data are estimated to be representative of 96 um, to 97 percent of the Canadian population. Uh, so um, that's, that's it covers a, a pretty broad swath of us. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, and then cycle seven data collection and analysis um, is presently ongoing. And those data will become available once completed. Um, and if you do the math, uh, you'll re recognize that uh, cycle seven has been delayed uh, due to COVID um, and they weren't able to get in the field on time. So there will be a delay between um, the end of cycle six and the beginning of cycle seven, which is unusual for these data. All right, so uh, again, looking at um, the six completed cycles and what's being collected in the seventh ongoing cycle of the CHMS, we've collected exposure data on a large suite of chemicals across multiple classes. Um, so the biomonitoring data available include biomonitoring of pesticides, nicotine metabolites, uh, metals and trace elements, consumer product chemicals, perfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS, and plasticizers. Um, most chemicals are measured in at least two cycles, and trend analysis is possible for chemicals that are measured in three or more cycles. 
So recent biobank projects undertaken by the National Biomonitoring Section have gone back to biomonitor um, in stored biospecimens, um, chemicals that only had two cycles of data. So we've now expanded the number of chemicals for which there are three cycles or more of data. Um, so we have uh, nationally representative data um, spanning um, over 10 years um, for biomonitoring of a large number of chemicals uh, in the CHMS, but not all questions um, that we need to answer can be answered by this type of large uh, nationally representative survey. So large surveys may help us to identify populations of particular interest and targeted studies can help us to better understand um, uh, chemical exposure in groups of people who may be understudied in large surveys or who face unique exposure risks. Uh, one such group of people are pregnant people and their children. Um, and uh, the way that we um, have undertaken biomonitoring um, in this population is through the Longitudinal Maternal Infant Research on Environmental Chemicals cohort. Um, and so one of the questions that we get quite a bit is, why would we want to follow a cohort of pregnant people and their children? Um, and of course, few studies measure chemical exposure through pregnancy and into childhood. Uh, and pregnant people experience physiological changes that may alter chemical exposures uh, or effects of chemical exposures. And developing fetuses and babies also experience different chemical exposures and are more susceptible to the effects of chemical exposures during periods of rapid development and sensitive windows. Early life chemical exposures can have long lasting health effects and um, those health effects may be passed on to the next generation. So um, additionally, um, pregnancy uh, can have a profound impact on long-term postpartum health. Um, and uh, these are all sort of parts of what Myrex research questions are. So Myrex research questions really are looking to address what are contemporary levels of exposure to environmental chemicals in windows of vulnerability, including pregnancy, early life, adolescence, and menopause? What are the effects of environmental chemical exposures on prenatal and postpartum health? And what are the effects of environmental chemical exposures on children's health? And so, uh, Myrick strives to answer these questions uh, through the Myrick Research Platform. Uh, many of you may be familiar uh, with Myrek. Uh, we originally recruited a cohort of about 2,000 pregnant women um, between 2008 and 2012. And I know that there are uh, several um, local uh, pregnancy and birth cohorts that were recruited at the same time. So we're in good company there. Um, and then um, we followed uh, the children and um, now the mothers through um, infancy and at six months, again, between two and five years of age, and now um, our endocrine and metabolic uh, follow-up, which started at age seven and will go through to about age 15. Um, We've measured over the, we've biomonitored over 2,000 chemicals um, in, uh, or sorry, over 200 chemicals, 2,000 would be a lot, over 200 chemicals um, in uh, the Myrek uh, parents and their children. And we continue to answer, to access the Myrek Biobank to answer new questions. Uh, so the key chemical classes, uh, some of the key chemical classes that we've measured uh, include phthalates, bisphenols, um, perfluoral alkyl substances, again, PFAS, um, metals, pesticides, uh, flame retardants, and polychlorinated uh, bisphenols. Uh, so uh, pregnant people and their children are one uh, especially uh, vulnerable population. However, there are other groups who experience greater exposure who, or who may be more vulnerable to exposure um, where more targeted research is required. Um, geography and diet are two determinants of exposure. 
um, that are especially important um, in the Arctic. So Arctic contaminants research um, is another important part of the targeted uh, biomonitoring work that we do. Carbon contaminants can affect people and wildlife far from where they're used and released. Um, most pollution in the Arctic is generated at southern latitudes and reach, reaches the Arctic from long range transport, either via air or ocean currents. Accumulation of contaminants in food is a primary source of contaminants in the Arctic. And this issue becomes more complex because foods are culturally important um, and there may be limited access uh, to dietary alternatives. So projects funded by the Northern Contaminants Program support human biomonitoring in northern populations. Um, Health Canada contributes to the Northern Contaminants Program, as well as to the um, International Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program. Um, so behavior um, can also impact exposure, and this includes both recreational and occupational choices. Um, and one of those um, areas of interest, uh, again, for ongoing targeted biomonitoring work um, is in firefighters. Uh, so as you may know, uh, cancer is responsible for over 85% of duty-related deaths of firefighters in Canada. And starting in August 2021, um, the Government of Canada announced a comprehensive firefighter action plan, um, which since then has um, gained royal assent as a national framework for prevention and treatment of cancers linked to firefighting. Additionally, uh, the International Association for Research on Cancer um, has evaluated occupational exposure as a firefighter as a group one carcinogen. Um, and Health Canada, um, since 2015 has been engaging in ongoing collaborative biomonitoring research in firefighters um, in order to support our um, obligations under the action plan. Uh, so that's sort of a, a, <laughs> a really fast tour of uh, the kinds of biomonitoring data that we have available and, and what what the aims of those are. Um, and now I'm going to talk a bit about how we use um, human biomonitoring data um, ourselves and so, so that maybe you can see your own research questions in, in what, how we use them. So hopefully it's useful. Um, <laughs> so um, how would we use human biomonitoring data? Um, so um, high human biomonitoring data are used uh, to identify geographical trends, to understand how exposure um, in one area may compare to the rest of Canada. Um, we can see how levels of chemicals of interest are changing over time um, through time trends. We can identify um, highly exposed uh, groups, so greater exposure. Um, we can um, increase our understanding of health effects associated with exposure to chemicals, and we can contextualize um, biomonitoring findings from other research. So, so here's an example of um, time trend data from the Canadian Health Measures Survey. Uh, so this is DEHP, which is a phthalate whose metabolites were measured in four cycles of the Canadian Health Measures Survey, cycles one, two, five, and six. And uh, performance measurement uh, for a risk management tool um, was completed. And uh, these biomonitoring data were, show, were used to show that um, exposure to DEHP um, was uh, declined uh, following implementation of a risk management strategy um, during cycle two. So um, these kinds of data are available for the nationally representative Canadian Health Measures Survey. And they are available through the Canadian Biomonitoring Dashboard. Um, so if you are interested in summary data, including time trends, um, there are summary data available 
uh, through this dashboard. And this dashboard allows users to easily search for and view these national biomonitoring results. Um, and environmental chemical levels in the Canadian population can be viewed through interactive data visualizations and tables. Uh, and what's really exciting about uh, this is that the data visualizations and the tables are also downloadable so that you're not just um, looking at a static table, you're able to um, export that into a format that works for you in your work. Um, just with the caveat that some types of data, um, specifically pooled serum uh, results, are not yet available in the dashboard. So there may be um, biomonitoring information uh, that's not uh, that's not yet available in the dashboard, but it is available um, it's still through the national biomonitoring section. So. All right. So um, the Myrick team uh, reports on biomonitoring re results um, for um, levels of environmental chemicals in pregnant people um, through descriptive publications. So here are four uh, recent descriptive publications um, looking at, um, at uh, biomonitored bisphenols, herbicides, uh, phthalates, and flame retardants. Um, and this descriptive analysis can help us to identify populations who may be more exposed. For example, um, when we're looking at um, blood lead levels in um, pregnant people, we can see that in MIRIC participants with lower incomes and in MIRIC participants born outside of Canada, there's a higher blood lead level during pregnancy. So this type of analysis can identify more exposed groups and may um, help to inform strategies um, uh, to communicate risk. So. so biomonitoring of environmental chemicals is commonly reported through these types of descriptive analysis. Um, but uh, envir and environmental epidemiologists um, examine determinants and distributions of exposures. This type of descriptive analysis supports exposure assessment, trend analysis, and risk management reporting. Um, but we can also ask ideologic questions um, using uh, biomonitoring data, uh, which I think is sort of more what many of us are familiar with. <laughs> Um, so we can look at um, health effects of exposure to environmental chemicals um, in uh, cross-sectional studies. We can look at health effects of concurrent exposure. And in longitudinal studies, we can look at health effects of, um, of past exposures. We can also look at sensitive time windows. Um, and we can look for protective or synergistic uh, co-exposures. Uh, using mixture methods and um, other approaches. Uh, so as, as you may know, longitudinal study design permits more robust analysis. You can maybe able to answer, uh, begin to answer questions about causality. Additionally, um, study designs that collect um, many covariates can permit more robust analysis. Um, the example I have here is just a directed acyclic graph um, from our student um, Sarah Packle McCormick's uh, work looking at uh, prenatal exposure to mercury and child IQ. And I just uh, am always amazed by the complexity um, <laughs> and the number of covariates that we need to consider. So. Um, Another example of uh, health effects work is that in MIRIC participants um, with higher first trimester arsenic and uh, lead exposure, we saw um, that there was a higher risk for hypertension and preeclampsia um, in the third trimester. 
and um, additional research seven to nine years postpartum indicates that pregnancy complications like hypertension and preeclampsia were associated with higher blood pressure and other negative health outcomes in the MARC participants. So um, again, longitudinal study designs allow us to link multiple um, health effects to exposure. All right, and uh, now I get to discuss gaps and challenges and opportunities to use biomonitoring of chemicals to respond to Canadians' concerns uh, through epidemiological research. And so um, I wanted to start with this picture and um, I think this, is, this picture really illustrates um, the question that, that I want to ask here, you know, as I, we're identifying gaps, who's missing in the Canadian biomonitoring landscape? Um, because when we think about nationally representative survey data, like from the CHMS, um, we have data that represents about 96% of Canadians based on a small number of factors. So age, sex, and regional distribution um, is what's uh, sort of a representative in the Canadian Health Measures Survey. But um, more recently, um, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act was modernized and um, it now includes right to healthy environment uh, as a key component in this updated legislation. So as we begin to consider right to a healthy environment and consider um, groups who may be disproportionately impacted by environmental chemicals, um, we have to consider a more inclusive science approach than just this looking at exposure in an average Canadian. And we need to shift towards looking at exposure in all people in Canada. Um, however, uh, when we consider these inclusive science approaches, um, and intersectionality, we also need to consider how we can make this transition uh, given the data that we have. Uh, we certainly don't want to throw out our Myrick babies um, with, with the bathwater. <laughs> so, um, so um, we already have biomonitoring programs that look at some specific vulnerable populations like pregnant people and, and their um, children. Uh, however, the makeup of, of those cohorts tends to be relatively homogenous and we may not have a diversity of intersectional identities to draw from um, for a more representative um, analysis. So for example, the Myrick cohort is 80% um, white, uh, 80% born in Canada. Um, they are older, uh, so about 60% are 30 years old of age or older when they um, when they were pregnant. Um, and uh, during their index pregnancy, they um, were less likely to be obese, were more highly educated, and um, less likely to have ever smoked uh, than the general population of people of childbearing age. So, um, so again, it's relatively homogenous population, and how can we answer questions about you know intersectional identity given these study populations? Well, but questions, uh, you know, there are questions that can still be answered um, using these data, and some of them may be factors that influence exposure that we couldn't have identified without looking at our existing cohorts. Um, so this is um, a result that I find really interesting. Um, and so I wanted to share it with you. Uh, this is from Mike Borghese's um, current uh, publication on uh, exposure to perfluoroalkyl substances um, seven to nine years after the Myrick index pregnancy. Um, and this is specifically looking at um, a PFAS called PFOA or PFOA. Um, and what you can uh, see is that um, levels of PFOA in female adults seven to nine years after their Myrick index pregnancy 
are significantly reduced based on the number of children they've had, subsequent pregnancies, um, significantly reduced based on lifetime duration of breastfeeding, and um, exposure increases um, with increasing time since last pregnancy. Uh, so these are the types of um, potentially more highly exposed subgroups or differences in exposure that we can still continue to look at um, by um, looking at, uh, at our existing cohort. Um, and in this case, we can also begin to tease out, uh, you know, that the physiological uh, changes associated with pregnancy and breastfeeding um, are uh, promoting loss of um, body burden of perfluoro alcohol substances, which I try not to think about where those chemicals are going. <laughs> um, out of out of our bodies um, and potentially into children being breastfed, uh, but we'll see. <laughs> um, and again, we can use um, these relatively homogeneous cohorts to look at impacts of additional factors. Uh, for example, in Myrick, um, participants with lower income had higher blood concentrations of toxic metals such as lead and cadmium. Uh, but had lower blood concentrations of persistent organic pollutants, um, including uh, PFAS. So um, once again, these are sort of our three pillars of types of data in Canada. General population from the Canadian Health Measures Survey, uh, pregnant people and their children from Myrick, and various targeted populations. Um, and there, there are research questions that we can ask that will better address some of the gaps in who we have data about right now. Um, you know, and it's just taking these results and considering how they can be used differently. And so returning to my original key gap and to our evolving focus, moving from um, the average Canadian to all people in Canada, um, we need to evolve the focus of biomonitoring to consider not just nationally representative data, but also populations at greater risk of exposure or with greater susceptibility. Um, and there are lots of approaches that we can take um, to help with this evolution. And it's hoped that um, those approaches would provide decision makers with information that they need to make decisions that protect everyone in Canada. Um, in the CHMS, for example, by combining cycles, we can increase um, the number of participants to get more representative information for uh, specific subgroups. And in the CHMS, we can also look at specific geographic locations um, separately. And there are still gaps and limitations when we try to use a survey uh, like the CHMS to look at um, some of these different populations because the survey is not designed to achieve that goal. Uh, but in many cases, the biomonitoring data from MIREC or the CHMS are the only Canadian data, either at all or in the populations studied for example, in pregnant people or in young children. So therefore, our current approaches are giving us information that we don't have elsewhere. Um, and so we need to continue to use these data and exploit, I don't like to use the word exploit when I'm talking about people's data, uh, but uh, to exploit these data to um, answer um, questions. Um, but, um, there's going to be limitations due to the design of these studies. Um, and there may continue to be questions that we can't answer using these study populations. So going forwards for us, uh, what we're foreseeing is that tar targeted biomonitoring in exposed and susceptible populations may become a greater focus. Oh, and as always, um, our focus, um, 
in targeted epidemiology and biomonitoring and in the national biomonitoring section is really to um, use the biomonitoring of environmental chemicals to um, give us new information so that that new information can inform the public, um, can support uh, future research, um, can be, uh, can, can broaden the um, scientific knowledge in general and uh, can be um, shared with um, risk assessors, uh, risk management and policy um, groups in order to advance uh, policy changes that protect the health of Canadians. So I'm just about at the end. <laughs> so um, if you have questions or ideas, or you're really interested in using uh, the types of data that we have available, um, then uh, MyRIC data are available um, through the MyRIC Biobank for researchers and their students with approved projects. Um, Canadian Health Measures survey data are available for researchers and their students with approved projects through the Statistics Canada Research Data Centers. Um, as far as our points of contact, um, my colleague uh, Kate Weary um, in the National Biomonitoring section um, is our point of contact for, the, for CHMS. Um, Jillian Ashley Martin is the uh, Marek Principal Investigator. Um, so she unfortunately gets all the email. <laughs> And um, for targeted biomonitoring, especially uh, in the Northern Contaminants Program, uh, Cheryl Curry is the contact person. Um, so that's who there is to contact. And then I just wanted to sort of bring this around um, to opportunities um, that we um, have to work with students um, who are at, in different um, public health and epidemiology programs at universities. Um, so there's the Federal Student Work Experience Program or FSWEP. And then for graduate students, there's the Research Affiliate Program. Um, so the Research Affiliate Program is for graduate students um, enrolled in an academic program that has a research component. Um, and we've had um, uh, more than several uh, students through those programs. Um, some examples of their projects have been uh, maternal exposure to phthalate mixtures and child IQ, air pollution and health effects in pregnancy, uh, mercury and IQ in preschool children, and perfluoral alkyl substances and maternal metabolic health and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Uh, so I'd just like to thank you all for your attention. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the National Biomonitoring Section, uh, especially Kate Wary, who um, made most of the National Biomonitoring Section content slides uh, for this. Um, I'd also like to thank the MIREC team, um, who are my team. Um, so PI Jillian Ashley Martin, uh, our retired PI Ty Arbuckle, um, as well as uh, Mike Borghese, uh, Mandy Fisher, uh, Christiana Cable, and Amani Abdel Fada, and then former and current uh, Merrick students, including Jana, Sarah, Priyanka, and Stephanie, um, all of whom I've uh, worked with and had a really great experience uh, learning from them and uh, helping to um, helping to work through ideas with them. Um, and uh, I need to acknowledge the Chemicals Management Plan, the Myrick Study Coordinating Center, and uh, CHMS and Myrick study participants. Uh, so thanks. Thank you, Robin. That was an excellent, oh. excellent presentation. <laughs> Thank you. I was uh, I was telling uh, Mariko that um, this was. If we had done this in person, it would have been my first in-person presentation in four years. So I'm not unhappy to have done this <laughs> in the more comfortable Zoom environment. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you for your flexibility on that. Um, <laughs> all right, well, we have some time for questions. I'm going to ask you to raise your, your digital hand. So you pop to the front of my screen 
And I'm going to take the um, chair's prerogative and ask the first question, Robin, while people sort of yeah. think what they want. Um, so at a few places you um, alluded to sort of like clinical outcomes for, for the people who you're also measuring environmental mm -hmm. exposures. And so I was wondering if through your platforms, you collect um, kind of clinical events or clinical outcomes or clinical diagnoses um, as well, or if you link to other databases that stats can um, has that has right. that information. Yeah. Um, so um, in the past, um, we've not been able to link like with the CHMS, they've not been able to link. Um, but looking for looking ahead and going forward, there's uh, appears to be um, now that there's a larger, you know, now that they've sort of achieve six cycles of data. Uh, there seems that there's going to be a possibility for data linkage, which would then permit some of that more um, administrative database style analysis of, of diagnosed health endpoints. So um, right now it's not possible, but looking ahead, um, that's uh, something that there may be an opportunity for. Within Myrec, um, we did not um, collect um, consent for linkage. Um, at the time of the original study. Um, so we would only be able to link people who were still in contact with now 12 plus years later. <laughs> um, uh, so, and we've not, um, we've not done that. And because that's a pan-Canadian study, um, uh, some of the linkage would, uh, <laughs> would be challenging in a way that it's not necessarily with stats can because the stats act gives them a little bit more uh, latitude. <laughs> so, uh, so I think that's sort of where we are. And so, but, but I did work um, prior to working in, in um, target epidemiology and biomonitoring. Um, I worked in air health effects research um, where um, we do, where, where there is a lot more uh, data linkage based um, environmental epidemiology going on. So things like um, the Canadian um, Environmental and Health Cohort, the CANCHEC cohort, which is a huge administrative um, cohort uh, that looks at um, air pollution exposure and disease outcomes and mortality uh, for everybody who's ever done a long form census. So awesome. Thank yeah. you for clarifying that. Yeah. Jim. Jim. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting uh, set of uh, data that you've got there. That's uh, <laughs> interesting. Um, and I like the idea that there is repeated uh, sampling for some of the studies. But what you described, Myrick, it sounds like that was just a one one and done. Is there going to be any repeat of Myrick, or how is it going to continue? Uh, yeah. The other thing you never mentioned was what is a sample size and uh, how many people are in this and what what is it what lost participation is it? I uh, sure. So for Myrick specifically, um, I Myrick um, recruited in about two thousand women in um, two thousand and eight to two thousand and twelve. Um, and uh, we're now 12 plus years out and we continue to have contact with about um, 1,200, um, I think just over 1,100 um, in our last follow-up. Uh, so our loss to follow-up um, is uh, approaching 50% now, unfortunately. Um, and we have, um, uh, we have in our follow-ups, not everybody agrees to participate in a follow-up. So uh, within the follow-ups, we've had uh, participation um, around uh, 600 in the last two follow-ups. So that's sort of the um, the ends that we're working with. Right. Is there any bias in sort of who remains and who leaves? Yeah, great question. And I think actually uh, my colleague Mandy Fisher uh, took a look at some of that bias um, in her thesis work. Um, so I may, I, I may suggest that I put you in touch with her. Uh, but um, yes, um, we do know that, um, well, one of the things that biases our loss to follow up is um, people 
uh, moving, of course, uh, but there are other factors uh, that, that seem to be different between people um, who were lost to follow up, um, including um, income and a couple of other factors, I think, uh, that, um, yeah, that seem to be different between the loss to follow up and the um, continuing group. Uh, so we do uh, try to consider that and we do try to put all of our results in the context of the original cohort um, when we're looking at our, our follow up. Yeah, uh, cohort you. studies are very difficult. Yeah, that, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is there any possibility yeah. of a, a new one starting? Um, we, ho <laughs> we hope so, but we're looking um, at new and different uh, strategies and approaches um, for, uh, for recruitment. Um, right now, we're undertaking um, a feasibility study looking at using community-based approaches um, for recruitment rather than tertiary care-based approaches uh, for recruitment of pregnant people. So that's, uh, that's one of the things that we're working on is sort of what would this next cohort look like and how could we make this cohort more, um, more able to represent people who are not usually captured in these types of cohorts. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. Yeah. Juliet. Thank you, Fiona. And thank you so much, Robin, for speaking to yeah. us about this, this topic. Um, you might know that Myrick is very important um, in its uh, being it, the use of it in seven mm -hmm. studies that allege that uh, fluoridation diminishes IQ. You're, you're probably familiar with that. Um, and, and those studies have had a, an important effect on people in that uh, one town in the United States actually has ceased fluoridation as a consequence of the use of the Myrick data. Myrick data. And Calgary um, might have reinstated fluoridation earlier, but for the use of the data. And this data, uh, the, the papers upon which, um, which use the Myrick data, are the principal evidence in litigation in the United States to end water fluoridation in that nation. So the, the data are very important. Um, and I'm wondering if you can speak about the availability of the data for reanalysis. And I have uh, before me correspondence from Dr. William Graham in which he states that the standard for release is uh, whether the people who propose to reanalyze the data will make a recognizable and significant methodological improvement to the analyses. Is, is that the standard? And if so, is that defensible? Julia, um, maybe I'm just, it's Robin. Julia no, is, is, is yeah. a lawyer. And um, so Julia, I'm just for, um, cause your question is a bit tricky. So maybe I'm just gonna reframe it a okay. little bit and, and yeah. ask, Robin, if you could just comment on um, uh, like the the process through which um, yeah. data release decisions are made. Uh, sure. So um, for the Myrick Biobank, uh, access to Myrick data and biospecimens is um, uh, controlled through my Myrick Biobank Access Committee, um, and that um, committee. Um, has, we have a, a set of um, documents that people who are seeking access are asked to complete, um, and then they review those uh, those proposals um, and uh, provide advice or um, request revisions. Uh, so it's an iterative um, uh, process um, to work with biobank applicants. Um, to uh, improve their access requests. Um, and then um, in general, uh, the Biobank, uh, the Myrick policies overall, because it's a, it's a huge uh, research platform, it has a lot of uh, investigators. And so um, 
there are um, research and uh, KT policies uh, related to it. And those policies um, include um, a requirement that research questions aren't um, duplicated so that uh, that's sort of the, the the overarching policy, and then um, in response to a request for reval for um, reanalysis, um, we revised uh, the biobank uh, policies uh, to include the potential uh, for reanalysis, and then. Um, we predicated that on uh, principles for reanalysis, I think that were um, recommended um, in a publication in JAMA. So I can find you the particular publication. Uh, but um, yeah, questions about biobank access. The easiest way um, is to go to uh, Myrick Canada um, and, uh, and get in touch with, uh, with the biobank manager. Um, who has right. all well, of those it, details. It, so I guess the general question is, um, given that children are significantly affected by city's decision to end water fluoridation based upon data that Myrick has collected, will Myrick release the data for reanalysis to qualified teams without without making them jump through hoops, you know, I, I've, I've read correspondence that I find frankly embarrassing as a Canadian um, in not making it available because it's very important that we know whether fluoridation reduces IQ. And so one would have thought that Myrick would say, yes, of course, reanalyze re the data. We need to know, we all need to know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, um... My experience is that the um, biobank access process um, is is straightforward, and um, so. <laughs> right. I don't. Well, I, think... I appreciate this may not be your your. Um, yeah, this is not. Uh, I, yeah. yeah, the biobank but, but like the biobank is... management committee is a is a is a separate committee that has Health Canada membership, but is not Health Canada um, okay. exclusively. So, so I don't mean to thank you, you Juliet. Yeah, maybe we can move on, Juliet. I think um, excellent points. And I do think, um, you know, Robin, if you could share out that JAMA paper that you referred to that had the principles under which mm -hmm. um, reanalysis would be would be um, considered uh, by Myrick, I think that'd be really helpful. So, uh, Carla, I see you have your hand up too. Oh, I'm on mute. Um, thank you for that. I think this is really interesting. So my like comment or observation maybe is a bit like broader, high level, maybe along the lines of what Juliet is thinking, but like, is there an opportunity here for knowledge translation or maybe has something been done along those lines? Because like in the, if you think of the general public, there can be a lot of fear, paranoia, um, even around different substances or different chemicals or compounds. And then obviously here you're monitoring chemicals and compounds that we maybe think there is some sort of reason to monitor them, like they bioaccumulate or they have a health impact or, or such and such. So is there a rationale then for which substances are included right. for biomonitoring? Mm -hmm. And then on the flip side, is there an opportunity maybe for some public education or knowledge translation around, you know, this is why we're not concerned about these substances, but this is why we are concerned about lead because I can, like, this is super confusing to the public, right? Like, we do want to <laughs> monitor things, but then we don't want you to be paranoid about all these mm -hmm. other little things that we're not, like, it creates like a, this kind of general problem in society. Like, what can be done yeah. about that? Let's sort of a higher level um, observation, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, the uh, when it comes to um, the National Biomonitoring uh, Section's work uh, with CHMS, um, they uh, have a specific prioritization system that they use for selecting the chemicals that uh, they want to look at. Um, and so they, um, 
go to all of our partners in risk assessment and risk management um, to find out um, where there are data gaps, where they'd like to see trend analysis, where they have um, risk uh, management uh, performance measurement that they'd like to do. Um, and so that sort of, they then compile a list of, of, of priority um, chemicals to biomonitor in um, that cycle. So right now, I think they've just completed prioritization for cycle eight. Um, so that's sort of the type of process that we use to select uh, chemicals. And then um, as far as um, sort of a communication piece, um, they also release on biomonitoring.ca, uh, biomonitoring fact sheets that talk about um, levels of chemicals um, in the Canadian population uh, to help inform people about um, about their levels of exposure. So um, I, those are um, those are a, a sort of public facing tool that they create. Uh, and then uh, within Myrick, um, we've not done as much, I would say, uh, public facing KT um, sort of as a as a study team. Um, and so, that's a gap that we're sort of trying to work towards filling. Um, so we're trying to work towards uh, more participant um, results sharing uh, and uh, some of those uh, approaches uh, could include you know, sort of public facing uh, summaries of what we found. One of the things that we always like to emphasize um, as the Myrick team is that for most of the chemicals that we have biomonitored in our um, research, the MAG participants are less exposed <laughs> than the general population. Um, and um, most of the chemicals that we're looking at are, um, you know, are, are being found uh, in levels lower than what uh, the, the current um, risk assessments suggest uh, could be levels of concern. So that's, that's sort of... <laughs> where we are, but I think we agree um, absolutely sort of as the Merrick team that we need to be, um, again, as we think about especially um, future community-based work, we need to be taking more of those those KT and, um, and communicating out um, approaches that uh, other groups like the Northern Contaminants Program do a much better job of, of communicating back to community in a way that's understandable and doesn't induce this anxiety, as you say, right? So, yeah. Well, thank you, Robin. In our just last minute here, I'll remind everybody that as Robin shared, the um, Canadian Health Measures Survey is available through the regional data centers. Um, of which we have two. One um, is up on the fifth floor of the Cal Wenzel Precision Health Building. Um, so super convenient if your office is over on the foothills side and we have two cubicles up there on the fifth floor that can be, be used because all of your uh, data analysis when you're accessing that, that kind of data through the RDC has to be done like in the environment. So you have to actually go up to the, to the workstations up on the fifth floor. Um, and then we also have a bigger regional data center on main campus, um, which I think has 12 workstations. So again, you know, just, just across 16th Ave, you don't have to track all the way to Ottawa to be able to use this kind of data. And we have those two resources um, available on campus. Um, last I heard they were underused. So again, if this is a data set that you are, you can yeah. see some, um, you know, initial exploration uh, analyses being useful to something bigger or, you know, sort of getting your feet under, under you about a particular kind of exposure. We do have those uh, resources here in our community readily available um, once you get your research proposal approved. So um, with that, I'll thank you, Robin, for your time. Um, it's yeah. been fantastic learning more about these different kinds of um, databases that are available. And um, mm -hmm. you gave us some contact information. Um, and so, um, thank you, and I wish everybody a wonderful rest of your day. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.